We've been going through the big picture of the Bible, and we had come last week to the New Testament. The New Testament itself is divided really only into four sections in terms of our period of Bible history. We have the period of the life of Christ. It covers Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have the period of the early church, which covers the book of Acts. And then we have the period of the letters to Christians uh, that covers Romans through uh, Revelation, those three those three periods. And we're coming now to our study of Acts, which records for us the, the early history of the church. We think about the book of Acts. The book of Acts is about the church. It's early history. It spans a period of time from somewhere around 30 A.D. to around 63 A.D. Uh, the beginning point is going to depend on where you uh, uh, identify the establishment of the church. Uh, some will give 33 A.D., some 29 A.D. It seems the evidence points more strongly in favor of 30 A.D. at any other point in time. That's my, what I think right now uh, in terms of reading through the evidence. So we're going to be about 30 A.D. to about 63 A.D. The last identifiable event in the book of Acts is what? Paul's imprisonment. He's in Rome, about 63 A.D., 62, 63 A.D., when the book of Acts comes uh, to a conclusion. It is a companion to the Gospel of Luke. Both Luke and Acts were addressed and written to who? Theophilus. Theophilus, which means a lover of God, probably a specific person. And the book of Acts really picks up right where Luke left, uh, left off. Uh, Luke, at the end of the Gospel, just sort of summarizing how the Lord went out and ascended, and Acts is going to give that to us in a little bit more uh, detail. Luke 1 in verse 3 and Acts 1 in verse 1 both identify Theophilus as being the recipient of those particular books. If we were going to give an outline of the book of Acts before we start going through the material, we could outline it this way. The Gospel in Jerusalem in chapters 1 through 7 where particularly the, the gospel is preached in Jerusalem. Uh, a great many of, of the individuals there in Jerusalem become obedient to the faith, including some that were leaders among the Jews. Then beginning in chapter 8 through chapter 12, you have the gospel in Judea and in Samaria, where Philip preaches, uh, Philip preaches the gospel in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 9, of course, you have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. You have the first Gentile convert in chapter 9, the gospel coming to Antioch of Syria. And then in chapter 13 through chapter 28, as we focus in on the preaching tours of the Apostle Paul, you have the gospel going into the ends of the world. And a good key verse to remember that just sort of sums up what is covered in the book of Acts is found in chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1 and in verse 8, the Lord is speaking to His disciples prior to His ascension into heaven. And this is what He said. He said, You shall receive power, uh, receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to Me in Jerusalem, in Judea, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That sort of sums up what's going to take place here in the book of Acts. The gospel going throughout the entire world. If you want an alternative way to remember the book of Acts, this is typically how I remember it now. But if you want an alternative way to remember the book of Acts, remember the primary character in the first 12 chapters is going to be Peter. We're going to follow Peter primarily. Now, not exclusively, but primarily he's going to be that character in the first 12 chapters. And then beginning in chapter 13 through chapter 28, he's going to sort of fade into the background and the Apostle Paul is going to become the primary, the primary character that we're going to follow in the latter half of the book of Acts. So let's begin this morning trying to get an understanding of the history of the early church here in Acts chapter 1 through probably Acts chapter 12 when I'm going to try to survey here in our study, in our study this morning. When Acts chapter 1 begins, our Lord is still in the midst of His 40-day period here upon the earth. We actually would identify if we were, if we were dividing things down exactly by verses as opposed to by books. We'd identify the first uh, 11 uh, verses of Acts chapter 1 as being in those resurrection days of the life of Christ. While our Lord is preparing His disciples, He's teaching them about the coming of the Holy Spirit, and then He ascends into heaven. 
When our Lord ascends into heaven, the disciples, not just the apostles, but some of the disciples came together into the upper room at Jerusalem, and there they waited for the fulfillment of the promise of God. While they were there, they chose a replacement apostle for Judas, a man by the name of Matthias, uh, who is chosen in verses 15 through the end of the chapter. Uh, he is one that had been a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the way, you learned Acts 1, and here's where that's a, 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 a particularly important section of the Scriptures. In Acts chapter 1, you learn of the qualifications of being an apostle. When they were going to choose the, the uh, replacement, they said somebody that's been with us from the beginning and has been a witness or has seen, this is down in verse uh, 22, a witness of His resurrection. One can't be an apostle unless he's a witness to the resurrection. You may remember that in Acts chapter uh, 9, uh, or uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when Paul was referring back to the events of Acts 9, then he talked about himself as being one born out of due time. Why could Paul be an apostle? Why did the Lord appear to him on the road to Damascus? He didn't have to appear to him to convert him, but he did have to appear to him in order for him to be a witness to the resurrection and then be an apostle. So are there any apostles today? Well, no, because there are no witnesses to the resurrection. So in Acts chapter 1, they choose Bar uh, they choose Matthias to be the replacement apostle. And the apostles then are all gathered together. And then on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, which is also known as the Feast of the First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Harvest, the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles. Um, if you go back to the very last part of Acts chapter 1, it said they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the apostles. And when the Holy Spirit, had, had, or when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, that is the apostles, were gathered together in one place, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them. That is, it fell upon the apostles, and only the apostles. And it gave them the ability to speak in tongues, that is, languages they had never uh, studied, never learned before. And it was not only the speaking in tongues, but the coming of the Holy Spirit was accompanied by the rushing mighty wind, the Bible tells us, and it, it appeared as divided tongue. Now, when the men that were in Jerusalem, and they were devout men that had gathered from every nation under heaven, because they'd come to the Feast of Pentecost, when they heard that sound, they rushed to that location, and it provided the apostles the opportunity to preach the first gospel sermon. And that first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2, at the beginning of the church, began with the apostle Peter defending the apostles by saying, we're not drunk, because that was the accusation that had been made by some that were present. We're not drunk, but what you're witnessing is indeed the fulfillment of what had been prophesied of in John chapter 2, concerning the Holy Spirit being poured out upon, upon all uh, flesh. He moved from talking about the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel 2 to talk about Jesus, that is the very center of that sermon. The entire sermon is designed to bring us to the conclusion down in verse 37 that God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. And he said Jesus of Nazareth was a man that God had attested to by the miracles that he performed. And you are witnesses of that. All of you that are present here know about all those miracles that he, had been, that, had, that he performed. And you took him, and by lawless hands, you put him to death. And that was God's plan from the very beginning of time. He was delivered by the determined counsel and the foreknowledge of God, or the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. But while he put him to death, it was not possible for death to hold him. In fact, the Old Testament had prophesied about his resurrection. Back in Psalm chapter 16, the, the, the psalmist had said that you will not leave your soul in Hades nor allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now we know David wasn't talking about himself. Paul, uh, Peter said we go right down we go down right now we can see David's tomb. He's dead. He's buried. His tomb is with us to this day. But he foreseen this spoke of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead in which we are all witnesses. Now if God raised him from the dead and has exalted him to his right hand in fulfillment of the promise made to David in Psalm 110 and verse 1, that he's both Lord and Christ. And it's at that point in time that the people cried aloud and said, what shall we do? That is, if, if what you're saying is true, they were convicted of that, they were cut to the heart, what do we need to do? And Peter said, well, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the
the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And those that gladly received his word were baptized, and that day they were added to them about 3,000 souls. And the early church continued to gather together, and they continued steadfastly in what? In the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And the Lord was added to the church daily, those that were being saved. And that's the third chapter. As the, 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 the history of the early church continues, Peter and John were going to the temple as they did daily about the hour of prayer. It's an opportunity to come in contact not, uh, with those that were uh, there to pray, but also uh, probably when they prayed for themselves. But as they were going, they ran across a man that had been lame from his mother's womb. And that man asked for money. He said, give me some money. And Peter and John, uh, Peter looked down at him intently and said, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to thee. In the name of Jesus and that is what? Arise. And so he arose and he walked. And that guy that got, got the attention of everybody that was present, because they know this man his whole life, that had been there laying and begging, that was over 40 years, according to Acts chapter 4. And Peter told them, Why are you looking at us as though by our own power we have done this? It's by the name of Jesus that this miracle was performed. And he used that as an opportunity to preach about Jesus. And he took them back and said, All the prophets have foretold of these days. They were pointing forward to the coming of Christ. In fact, he said uh, in verse 22, Moses had prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 18 about a prophet that was going to be likened to him. In verse 24, yes, all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed have spoken of these or foretold of these days. And so Jesus, in verse 26, was raised up. And that's not talking about his resurrection, by the way, in verse 26. He's talking about raised up in the sense of verse 22, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like unto Moses. Verse 26, to you first God having raised up his servant Jesus. That is, he's the fulfillment of that prophecy made in Deuteronomy chapter 18 about a prophet coming that was going to be one like unto Moses. Well, as the crowd gathers and begins to listen to this, this sermon, the, the, the chief priests and the leaders among the people are greatly disturbed. They're disturbed in Acts chapter 4 to the point that they arrest these men because they are preaching Jesus in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That would have been particularly irritating to those that were sitting on the, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, and the leaders among the people, because they were all Sadducees. Or for the most part, they were Sadducees. And Sadducees denied the resurrection from the dead. They are those that in Matthew chapter 22 had questioned Jesus in that final week on that day of controversy. So they, they arrest Peter and John, and they drag them before the rulers and the elders of the people, and they say, by what name have you, and by what power have you done this miracle? And Peter said, Phil being filled with the Holy Spirit, by the way, that's the fulfillment. Matthew chapter 10, 17 to 20, Luke chapter 12, 11 to 12, where Jesus had said they would appear before kings and councils. And he said, on that day, you don't have to what? Give any thought about what you're going to say because it's going to be given to you on that day. So that's the fulfillment of the promise that the Lord had made to them while he was still here upon this, still here upon this earth. And Peter then began to speak, and he said, Rulers of the people and the leaders of Israel, if we as they are judged for a good deed done to the helpless man, by what means has he been made well? You brought us in here for healing him, but what power made him well? And he said, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead by him, this man stands here before you whole. In fact, this one that healed him, he's the one that had been talked about in Psalm 118 and verse 22 when the Lord said the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Let me tell you about that name that made this man whole. There's no, sal there's no salvation to be found in any other name given among men. There's no other name given among men whereby he must be saved. Well, as he begins to give his defense before the council in Acts chapter 4, they say, this looks familiar. This kind of boldness, this kind of courage, this kind of knowledge. We've seen this before. These men must have been what? They must have been with Jesus. They took knowledge that they had been with Jesus, the old King James Version says. But then it says down in verse 14, and seeing the man who had been healed standing before them, they could say nothing. I mean, they couldn't refute the miracle. Here's this man that asked for 
22 says, been lame for over 40 years. Everybody in town knew this man. We can't deny that he can walk. What are we going to do? And so what they decided to do is they decided that they would threaten them. They said that an miracle, miracle has been done through them as happened. Don't you find it interesting, by the way? Here's a crowd, the Sanhedrin Council, the leaders of the people that are gathered together say, listen, a miracle has been performed. We can't deny that. And yet, they don't accept the implications of that miracle. They don't want to accept Jesus as being the Christ. They're still concerned what, about their standing, about their position. And so they said, here's what we're going to do. We'll just severely threaten them. And from now on, we're going to tell them to quit this preaching. So we're going to make things difficult. So they come back in. The Bible doesn't detail for us everything that was said. But I expect it was something like this. We're telling you right now. We want this preaching in the name of Jesus to stop. And if you don't stop it, what? You remember what happened to Jesus? Same thing might happen to you. You, we'll, we'll do everything we can to see that you're executed or put to death. We'll make your life miserable if you continue to preach in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter said, Well, they try to listen to you more than God, you judge. But we cannot but speak the things which we've seen or heard. Peter said, No deal. You can threaten us all you want, but we're going to continue to preach. We're going to continue to teach. And back when they left, what must have been so irritating to... Uh, the Sanhedrin council is the fact that they became even more bold. In fact, they come back and, and, and to the other companions. Remember, this is just Peter and John. And they come back to their companions. I think that's the other apostle. And they said, let me tell you what just took place. And they relate all the story about the healing of the lame man, about the being drugged before the rulers, about how they threatened them. And the Bible said, listen, in verse 24, when they heard this, they raised their voice to God with one accord. What did they do? When things were getting hard, they what? They prayed. And they prayed to God. And what they did is they appealed back to Psalm chapter 2, among other passages, and they said, listen, we realize all of this effort that is being put forward to destroy your kingdom and destroy your cause is absolutely useless. The nations rage and they plot strange, uh, plot vain things, but the kings there take their stand and the rulers are gathered together against the Lord against His Lord. You go back to Psalm 2, what that's saying is, Lord, we realize they're not going to destroy your kingdom. Let me ask you a question. As we said right, we lament about the world we live in. We lament about the direction our country is going in, right? So, and we're concerned about what if this person gets in leadership? And what about if they pass this law? Or what if, that, uh, if they make it more difficult for us to serve the Lord? How often have you ever in prayer acknowledged to the Lord, Lord, all of this is just useless. All of this is like they can't what? Destroy your kingdom. They can try, they can threaten, but your kingdom will always what? Stand. It's all for vain because, Lord, in the end, you're going to come out on top. You think we ever need to be reminded of that in our day time? You think we need to offer that prayer that they offered up? Not only did they offer the prayer, they filled the song chapter 2 and said, Lord, all this is useless, but they also come down in verse 29 and they said, Lord, look on their threats, threats and give your servants boldness, or grant your servants that with all boldness, they may uh, speak your word. And the Lord, help us to be courageous. Give us the courage that we need. The Lord do that. He did. You have to strengthen them. You see that throughout the book of Acts. Well, there is another problem, by the way, that occurs in Acts chapter 4. And that is that all these people that had come to Jerusalem to worship on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 had obeyed the gospel. And it seems to me that in all likelihood what happened is some of them stayed behind in the early days of the church. They wanted to be near their brethren. They wanted to be near the apostles to hear the, the preaching of the gospel and to strengthen their faith. But there's a problem that accompanies that. And that is that it's not going to be long to what? Some need some assistance. They've left behind their livelihood. They've left behind their jobs. And so they're going to need some assistance as they get back up on their feet. And so... In Acts chapter 4, we learn that the attitude of the early Christians was that we have all things in common. And that does not mean that they practice some socialistic or communistic concept where everything is sort of put into a pot and we just all divide evenly. It is an attitude that 
that says what is mine is yours what? If you need it. There's particularly one individual that is brought out as an example in Acts chapter 4. Who is that? A man by the name of Joseph. We remember him better as what? Barnabas. And Barnabas says, and it said about Barnabas that he uh, saw, had a land and sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. We'll be introduced to this man a little bit later on again. Well, we come to Acts chapter 4. We really deal with uh, perhaps one of the, 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 the early church problems in Acts 4. It's not a major problem. It's a problem with two individuals. That is, a man and his wife, Ananias and Sapphira. They have seen the selling of the goods by Barnabas and by others. Um, I don't know exactly what prompted them to lie. I think we could speculate a little bit. Maybe others had talked about it. Can you imagine a scenario where other people are, yeah, that Barnabas, he's just what? He's a great guy. You know what he did? He sold his land. He gave, and others began to talk about Barnabas and others that have done that. And that may have prompted Ananias and Sapphira to say, we want to get it on this attention too. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly why they do what they do. But they, they sell some land. And they bring it to, uh, to or they sold a possession, that's the land, they sold a possession, and they bring it to the uh, apostles, Peter, and they lay it down at his feet, and they said, What? They said, All we got. Now, did they have to give it all, by the way? No. In fact, what did the Lord tell them? What did the Lord tell them? Peter tell them? When it was yours, you could have done with it what you wanted to. Okay? It was within your power. Nobody, the, the Lord didn't say what? You have to sell your land and you have to come and, and give every bit of that money to the apostles. They could have sold the land and given half. They could have sold the land and given a quarter. They, there's nothing that said they had to give all. The problem is not in the amount that they gave. The problem is what? In the lie that they said. In fact, Peter gives them the opportunity when the Ananias brings the money. He says, you, you sell it for what? So much? Yeah, that's the amount. What happened to Ananias? He struck dead. And then Spira later on comes in and they ask about the, the matter and she sticks with the story and what happens to her? She drops dead too. And in fact, uh, I've often wondered what the look on her face must have been like when Peter said to the people that what? Just carried your husband out feet first or about to carry you out too. And they did. What happened to the church as a result of that? They grew Somebody might have thought, if you're looking at it from, from a human perspective, you know how I thought, well, I think what people are still clear of the apostles and the church, right? Once word gets spread. But you know what happened? The church grew, the Bible tells us. Uh, down in verse 11, a great fear came upon all the church and upon all those that heard it. And then you continue on reading, and you read that, 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 that believers in verse 14 were increasingly added to the church. In fact, it wasn't long after that did cost, the number of men came to be about what? 5,000. I'm just amazed at, at the rapid growth of the church there in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5. Well, in Acts chapter 5, the apostles are again arrested. And they're drugged before the Sanhedrin council. And they, I mean, they're just indignant that they have continued to preach in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And what happened... And it's sort of funny when you read through it in Acts chapter 5. The apostles are arrested and they're put in prison. And an angel comes and what? Lets them out. And what do they do? They go right back to preaching. And this is the funny part. That um, when the officers come in and now find them, in the prison in verse 22, they return and report it. Indeed, we found the prison shut securely. The guards are standing outside before the doors, but when we opened them, we found nobody inside. And this just doesn't make sense. Everything's locked up tight, but what? They're nowhere to be found. And when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome could be. What can happen? Where did these men go? And all of a sudden, somebody comes running in and says, What? They're standing out there preaching. Now they must have irritated those leaders because they're thinking, this is the very thing we're trying to put an end to and they're out there preaching again. So they bring them in, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 5. And they said, you must have misunderstood us. 
Did we not strictly say to you not to teach in the name of Jesus, or in this name? And look, you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. You continue to and you're accusing us of murder. In the meantime, you're putting his blood on us. And that's when Peter answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than that. Did you tell? Yeah, that's exactly what you told us to do. But we don't care. We're going to obey God instead of obeying man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom he murdered by hanging, on a, hanging him on a tree. And God had exalted him to his right hand to be the prince and the savior of the world. And we're witnesses to these things. And so also the Holy Spirit that God has given to those that obey him. The Bible said when they heard this, they were furious. That means they were cut to the quick. By, by the way, it's just a very similar phrase to what's found over in Acts chapter 2. They were cut to the heart. And it was letters that they were cut to the quick. But this time, it's a negative sense. What do they want to do with him at this point? They want to put him to death. That's miserable. Let's just put an end to it. We'll, we'll kill, him, kill him right now. And, of course, they're, they're not thinking logically, by the way, in a number of different ways. First of all, they put him to death without a Roman trial. They themselves would have been in violation of the law. That's why they went that route in regard to Jesus. But when one's angry, when one is that indignant, when one is really cut to the quick, do they always think logically? No, they don't. But there's a sort of a calmer voice that speaks up. Who is it? Amen. Uh, we're going to remember him, besides this event here in Acts chapter 5, we also remember him as what? The teacher of Paul. Paul taught him. And what Gamaliel says it, to, to, to the leaders is, uh, we just need to leave them alone. If this is a plan of men, and this is something that they made up, if it's nothing more than a fairy tale they're telling, then eventually what? It's going to fizzle out and die. And typically, people uh, are, are uh, plans like that that are made up by men. Men are not going to be willing to die and give their life. Eventually, it's going to fizzle out. Okay. But if it's from God, what? We can't stop it anyway. We're not going to stop it anyway. And so. They, they decided instead of killing them, they would just beat them. And they beat them again, and they commanded them in verse 40, don't teach any more in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And again, how this must have irritated them. I bet they were cut to the book again in verse 41. They beat them, they threatened them, and it said they departed in what? Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Can you imagine that? They beat these men. They threatened them. They told them next time it's going to be even worse. And I just picture these men walking out with a smile on their face rejoicing. They've been able to suffer for the name of Jesus. Would that, that be your attitude, by the way? Would that be my attitude? That's certainly something for us to think about. Well, we come to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. I know we're going through this quickly. We're serving on number 28 chapters and two lessons. So that, that's what we're doing. Acts chapter 6, the first church problem. There were some among the Hellenists that were complaining that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Was this, was this, was this a real problem? Sure. I think it was. Um, you know, and, and I base it on the fact that when they come to the apostles, the apostles didn't say, well, that's all in your head. You know, that's not real. Uh, by the way, I learned this sometimes. Sometimes a slight in Acts chapter 6 and a sometimes... Even mistreatment is unintentional. Do you think they intentionally decided to neglect the widows in their daily distribution? No, I don't think so. I don't think this was an intentional oversight. I don't think that the that any of the leaders among the church of Jerusalem sat around and said, "You know what? Let's not give them their fair share." I mean, in fairness to the apostles and any others that might have been responsible for seeing that everybody was getting their daily distribution, this is the helping of the needy saints. How big is the church of Jerusalem now? I mean, over 5,000 men. And you've got among the apostles what? 12 men that are trying to what? Oversee all of this. Can you begin to see why some oversight might have been unintentional? And so, but even unintentional slides need to be what? Need to be dealt with, need to be corrected. And so the plan was uh, given that we're going to appoint seven men. And to give qualifications to those, and they're going to see to this work of what? Overseeing the these needs. So that we, that is the apostles, can devote ourselves to what? What's really important preaching and teaching the word and, and, and prayer. 
Uh, some debate are these deacons or not deacons. There's some debate about that among biblical uh, scholars, among members of the church. They do the work that a deacon would do in the terms of service because one of the purposes, I believe, that a deacon serves is it frees up those that are elders to what? Devote themselves to what's really important, which is what? The spiritual welfare, the spiritual needs of the congregation. And so that problem is, is put to rest and it seems to everybody's uh, satisfaction. Among those that were chosen to deal with that first problem, and the Hellenists, by the way, we all know this was a Greek-speaking uh, Jew, probably and primarily from outside of Palestine that had come in. But at the end of Acts chapter 6, one of those men that was chosen, man by the name of Stephen, is preaching in the synagogue of the freedmen. And that really occurs over in chapter 7 of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 7, the reaction to, to, Peter, to, to uh, Stephen's sermon, by the way, Acts chapter 7 is a good survey, a very quick survey of the history of the people uh, of Israel. When we see the, their, their history, when we see uh, from the very beginning when God calls, uh, uh, called Abraham to uh, the patriarchs on up through Moses, all that is surveyed in Acts chapter uh, 7. And it leads up to... Uh, to Stephen's pointing out that the attitude that those people had possessed toward the Lord and toward his apostles was really an attitude that was still present in the people of that day. In fact, down in verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in the heart. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. You're not listening. Guess what? They didn't listen. What happened in, in terms of their reaction to that sermon by Stephen? They were cut to the quick. They were cut to the heart, the Bible tells us. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. And they put him to death. And Stephen's attitude, by the way, here, a couple of interesting things happened at the end of Acts chapter 7. Now, number one, you see in the attitude of Stephen, his prayer for these people. Uh, he wanted these individuals to do what was right. He said, do like the Lord had shown on the, on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Um, and then he died. But the last thing that is recorded that he said is praying for the very ones that were taking his life. And so you see, he certainly exemplifies the attitude of the, of the Lord uh, in that prayer. The other interesting thing at the end of Acts chapter 7 is the fact that when they're stoning Stephen, Stephen sees the, the heavens open. And he sees the Son of Man, what? Amen. Standing at the right hand of God. And that's interesting because we almost always find Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. And um, there are different explanations for that. I think part of that is it shows the deep concern God had for His people, Jesus had for His people. That there He was observing and standing, watching what was taking place. He was well aware of what Stephen was going through. And uh, you know, he was not in a position of comfort of, of sitting, but rather standing at, at the right hand of God, whether that's overly significant or not, depending on who you listen to, but I do find it interesting that he is standing as supposed to sit at the right hand of God. Well, at that point in time, the persecution of the church just rolled over. Acts 8, well, we remember primarily as uh, the, the work of Philip, but the chapter begins by introducing us to a very significant character. Actually, Acts 7 introduces us to the character, and then he becomes more prominent again in Acts chapter 8. There was a young man in prison when all of this was taking place. Now, he didn't pick up the stones, he didn't throw the stones at, 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 at Stephen, but he held the coats of the men that did. And that is a young man by the name of Saul. Now, as Stephen died, that persecution grew bolder. And now when Acts chapter 8 opened, Saul was consenting to it. He gave hearty approval, one translation said, to the death of, of Stephen. And the persecution begins in earnest. In fact, the Bible said he made havoc of the church or he ravaged the church to the point that the saints in Jerusalem had to go what? Elsewhere. In fact, those that were uh, scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And so the, the, the church in Jerusalem sort of scatters. Uh, you know, what, what was, by the way, sometimes what seems to be negative on the surface and sometimes be a positive thing. You think about the fact that had they all just stayed in Jerusalem, everything had just been great right there in the city of Jerusalem, no persecution, no problems, what would have happened? They'd been content to sort of stay there. What would have happened to the gospel? What would have spread? 
That persecution that certainly was not enjoyable or oppressive, what it caused, it caused people what? To leave what they take with them. The gospel. And they began preaching it everywhere. Particularly there's a man by the name of Philip. Where does he go initially? He goes down to Samaria. And he preaches uh, Christ. And both men and women are baptized. There is an interesting convert in Samaria. A man by the name of Simon. What is he? He's a sorcerer. He's a charlatan and a deceiver. I mean, he's made his livelihood deceiving people. Now, he realizes when Philip performs a miracle, what? There's something different about that than what I do. This, that, that's real. That is authentic. And he obeys the gospel too. Now, here's an important lesson in Acts chapter 8. Philip had the ability to perform miracles. He needed that in order to confirm the word of God. I mean, time prior to uh, the complete revelation of God, that was important. But while Philip had that ability, he did not have the ability to do what? Pass that on to somebody else. Who, only, who had that ability? The apostles. So Peter and, and John come down and they, they, they impart that gift unto, uh, unto others. And Simon observes that. He sees that through the laying on of their hands, through the apostles' hands, this, this uh, imparting of the Holy Spirit uh, was uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit were given, and Simon gets to think, you know what, this could be a pretty good money maker. You know, if I could do that too, what? That, that'd be great. And so he offers them money to what? Give him that ability. And that's where Peter reproves him and says, you have neither part nor portion in this matter. He goes on and tells him that, uh, that your money perish with you. You thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. For your heart is not right in the sight of God. And repent of this thy wickedness and pray to God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. To Simon's credit, What's his response? He said, pray for him. You know, I think Simon, Simon was guilty of sin. That sin is separated from God. He was poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity according to the apostle Peter. But he still wanted to do what's right. And so he said, pray for me. And that none of these things may come upon me. And when they testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in the villages of the Samaritans. Well, then in Acts chapter 8, we also have the conversion of the Ethiopians. Eunuch, where Philip goes down and uh, by direction of the Holy Spirit overtakes him in the chariot and preaches the gospel. And beginning at Isaiah chapter 53, he was a religious man. He was reading from Isaiah chapter 53. He didn't understand the passage. Uh, and Peter uh, preached Jesus to him again in that passage. And he came to some water and said, What hindered me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with your heart, you may. And he said, I believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, so guys, and they baptized him. And so uh, Philip uh, baptized the Ethiopian unit. You know, what is significant about the Ethiopian unit is a couple of things uh, in terms of the, the spread of the gospel. Number one, it, it points out to us, as other passages do, that being religious alone is not enough. You know, here's a man that had gone all the way from what? Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. Was he a lost man? Yeah. He was. That's why he the gospel. In all likelihood, Ethiopian unit was a man of color. So the gospel certainly crosses all racial and cultural boundaries when he obeys the God. He's a man of great authority under Queen Candace. And so those that are, sometimes even those that are mighty will hear the gospel and obey the gospel. A number of lessons you learn from Acts chapter 8. And Acts chapter 9. Where am I on time? What time is it? How about 9.40? 9.40, okay. Let's get to it. A few more chapters here really quick. Acts chapter 9. There's a man by the name of Saul. The Saul we we're introduced to in Acts chapter 7. He's going to, uh, to Damascus to persecute the Christians there. He gets letters of authority from the, the chief priests in Jerusalem. And he's going to go get uh, men and women there and bring them back and put them in prison. All the way to Damascus, the Lord appears to him on the road. And how it must have frightened Saul of Tarsus when he asked who was speaking and the voice came back and said what? This is Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And so uh, Saul said, what, what do I need to do? And the Lord told him to go into the city of Damascus and there be told to him what he needed to do. And so he was led by the hand, because he could see, into the city of Damascus. And there later on, after praying for three days, a man by the name of Ananias came to him. And he 
put all the accounts together in Acts 9, and Acts 22, and Acts 26, and I told him, Why are you tearing? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Call on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. Acts chapter 9 tells us that when he taught, was taught the gospel immediately, he arose and was baptized. And the great persecutor of the church became the great proclaimer of the gospel immediately. He began preaching Christ in the synagogues, that He is the Son of God. And people were sort of amazed at that, saying, isn't He the one that's persecuting the church? And now He's preaching, preaching the gospel. In fact, as He preached the gospel in Arabia, uh, or, or in uh, Damascus, He'd already gone into Arabia, according to Galatians 1, 15-18. And then He came back to, and had to be uh, led out of the city of uh, Damascus because they wanted to put, uh, take his life and he came to Jerusalem and he became a member of the church there at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 10, we read about the first Gentile becoming a, uh, that should be becomes a Christian, not a persecutor. A Gentile becomes a Christian. A man by the name of Cornelius. What is he? He is a uh, member of the Italian regiment. He's a devout man. He's one that feared God with all his household, and he gave alms generously to the people. Uh, Cornelius was the kind of man that had a good reputation among the Jews. No small accomplishment, by the way, for an uncircumcised Gentile. Uh, maybe I should put on here when we go through chapter content, and I've still got to get caught up on all that. I think I've got you through what Ruth on the, in the books in the back, but we're, we're, I'm getting it. We're, we'll get there and get all the chapter content of the entire Bible uh, through there. If I can give you Acts probably uh, tonight, if I get it put up, it probably should put there an uncircumcised Gentile becomes Christian. Have Gentiles become Christians up at this point in time? Yes. But what about Acts chapter um, 8, the Ethiopian unit? But they were proselytes. They were, they, they were circumcised Gentiles. They had become, for all practical purposes, what? Jews. But now here is an uncircumcised Gentile that has obeyed the gospel. And Peter is given a vision about the, the great sheep being let down and all the unclean animals in it. And the Lord said, what? Eat them. Rise, kill, and eat. Peter says, what? No, I, I'm not eating anything unclean. I'm about to start now. It happens uh, three times. And then about that time, the knock on the door happens. And Peter's going to go down to Cornelius' house. Somewhere between that vision and him coming to Cornelius' house, Peter realizes, what? That ain't about... Meat. It's not about eating what? Pig or anything else. This is about people. In fact, what I think the key verse of Acts chapter 10 is beginning verse 34 and 35. Peter said, In truth I perceive God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted of Him. No matter who you are, no matter what nation you're from, God doesn't show partiality. If you're willing to what? Fear God and willing to serve Him, God will accept you. And Cornelius and all his household heard that gospel preached, and they obeyed the gospel. One significant thing happened in Acts chapter 10. The Holy Spirit came upon them. Came upon them prior to what? To be baptized. And it wasn't a sign of their salvation. Those that argue that Acts chapter 10, see that shows the baptism not is essential for their salvation. Not so. The purpose of the Holy Spirit coming upon them was God's way of showing to Peter and everybody else there what? God has accepted the uncircumcised Gentile. In fact, you see the animosity that had existed prior to, to this. In Acts chapter 11, when Paul, uh, when Peter excuse me, gets back to Jerusalem, the people are, are standing at the door ready to say to Peter, what? what were you doing? What were you thinking? You went in down and circumcised Gentiles and you ate. You can't do that. And Peter said, let me tell you what happened. And Peter related the events from the very beginning. He said, I went down. And God gave them the same gift as He gave us at the beginning. That's Holy Spirit baptism, if you ask me. I, you know, the same way they receive the Holy Spirit. Different purpose, the same means of giving it. Came directly from heaven. He said, God gave them the same gift as He gave to us. And who was I that I could withstand God? Peter said, who was I to tell God what? I think you're wrong about that. You know, you shouldn't do that. How could I tell God He was wrong? And when the people heard that, what did they do? They rejoiced that God also granted unto the what? Gentiles are penitent of life. They, they, they rejoice. They're, they're excited. The Gentiles heard the gospel. In fact, the end of Acts chapter 11 reports for us the church at Antioch of Syria. There's two Antiochs in the book of Acts. There's Antioch of Pisidia. That's where 
the Jews are going to respond with great animosity toward the gospel. And they're going to run the Apostle Paul outside out of the city. There's also Antioch in Syria that becomes the starting point for those three preaching tours that are going to be done. And for the first time at the end of Acts chapter 11, the Gentile, that the Jews are making a concerted effort to take the gospel to the Gentiles. In fact, the church at Antioch became, uh, grew to the point that the church of Jerusalem said, we need to send somebody down to what? Have encouraged them and they sent a man by the name of Barnabas who was a good man who was going to encourage them that they should continue with the Lord. It's also at Antioch of Syria that the disciples were first called Christians. I believe the fulfillment of prophecy made in the book of Isaiah. And so the church is growing, and now it's growing with not just the addition of Jews, but also Gentiles are hearing the gospel preached. Well, it'd be nice if everything was just going great, but in Acts chapter 12, there's a concerted effort to persecute the church. In fact, in Acts chapter 12, who's put to death? James is put to death. And when James is put to death, Herod realizes, you know what? The Jews were wrong with that. And so if they like putting James to death, I bet they're going to love what? Putting Peter to death. So he arrests Peter and puts him in prison. While Peter's in prison, constant prayer is being offered by the church for Peter. I don't know what they were asking. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us. Maybe they were all uh, praying for his release. If they were, they were surprised when it was answered. They may have been praying for Peter to be strong enough to endure through that. Give them some comfort. They may have been praying partly for the church. That if Peter is, is, is killed, give us what? The strength to carry on. Maybe they were praying for all of those. And just saying, Lord, you do what you think is best in answer for that prayer. But what happened is... The, 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 an angel let Peter out of prison in Acts chapter 12. In fact, when Peter comes through, the door open, the, the Greek word of its own accord, automate, meaning automatic, and I mean open on its own when he came through. And he came and he knocked on the door, and you remember that uh, there was some uh, confusion there when he came. Somebody, no, you, you can't be right, it, it can't be Peter. Rhoda is the name of the, the girl there. And they realized that indeed it wasn't an angel. It, it, you know, in fact, listen to what they said in verse 15. You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said it is his angel. And so Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And he told them to keep silent. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another uh, place. Uh, Herod, by the way, that persecutor dies at the end of Acts chapter 12 because he took the glory of God for himself, except that worship, and he is struck dead. Well, that's a lot of stuff in Acts 1 through Acts chapter 12 this morning. And we're going to get Acts 13 through 28 on, on Wednesday night. We'll survey that. Hope I have time to go over the questions. That was number two, right? So we'll, we'll do our best to get, get that covered on Wednesday night.